Hi, welcome to the podcast. I'd like to uh, welcome today Brian McConnell, author and historian, and from Nova Scotia. So, Brian, just before we really get into the it today, can you just give us a brief background on who exactly is Brian McConnell? Yes, I uh, I come from uh, an Irish. Uh, Canadian background. I, I grew up in Ontario, um, studied university at Queen's in Kingston, where I, I did an honors degree in history, and then considered the, doing postgraduate work in history, and it, and it applied to the master's program where I was accepted, but also applied to law school. And uh, I ended up getting accepted into law school at Dalhousie in the Maritimes. Uh, and I, I like Halifax, so I came to Nova Scotia and completed my law degree and uh, went into uh, general practice as a lawyer in Digby, Nova Scotia. And I've been practicing law here for 35 years uh, as a profession and then uh, pursuing my interest in history on the side and with a lot of uses, uh, genealogy. And I had done some family genealogy starting back about 30 years ago, uh, looking into my mother's family history, and it showed that one of the earliest uh, ancestors was the United Empire Loyalist who settled uh, along Lake Ontario. Uh, she also had some uh, European ancestors, uh, Irish, who came over during the potato famine. Uh, and then my dad's family, more recently, my grandparents came from County Monaghan, Ireland, and I visited over there quite frequently. And then about 25 years ago, I applied for it and obtained dual citizenship as, a, as an Irish uh, citizen as well as a Canadian citizen. Um, I did that really out of my interest in, in my heritage and my family background and starting to learn more. With these groups uh, that I was interested in, I, I met people uh, through the Loyalists, uh, I got involved with the United Empire Loyalist Association. And over time, I became involved with the Nova Scotia branch uh, and certified my own uh, United Empire Loyalist ancestor. And then volunteered to serve on their board. And currently, I'm the president of the Nova Scotia branch. And I also serve on the uh, national executive. Then with my dad's background, the Irish background, uh, I learned more about Ulster Scots. And most people think if their family's from Ireland and they're Irish, but history breaks that down a little bit. The, most of the people living in Ireland fall into one of three groups, the, the Celtic Irish, the Anglo-Irish, and the uh, Ulster Scots, or also known as Scots-Irish. Uh, so I investigated that more and learned more about it. And I met some people, coincidentally, in the early 1990s, there was living in the Annapolis Valley, Nova Scotia, Willie Brennan. Willie is a popular entertainer and storyteller uh, from Ballymena County, Antrim, Northern Ireland. Uh, he was uh, working and living here with his family for a number of years. Now he's back in Northern Ireland, where he's pursuing his musical uh, and writing interests. But he started up uh, with others, uh, an association called the Ulster Scottish Society of Canada. And I also participated in that. And we held musical events. Willie plays the fiddle, uh, he sings, uh, he plays other musical instruments. And we had a, a branch of the association which also focused on genealogy, trying to assist people tracing their family heritage back to uh, the north of Ireland or Northern Ireland. And then, and then more recently, okay. I mean, I mentioned that I, I, I've been practicing law for 35 years. I'm now retiring. In fact, this is my last month as a lawyer. Uh, and uh, I've been writing a number of articles. And in the last month, uh, I found time in, in November to complete a book on the Ulster Scots, which brought together a number of articles and research that I've done over the last 20, 25 years. Okay. So with this book, um, 
how can it be used as a, as a resource for other genealogists? The, the, uh, the book includes uh, seven stories which uh, deal with uh, Ulster Scott's experiences in coming to Canada. Uh, several of those specifically look at the Atlantic Canada. One is the case of uh, William Somerville and the Ulster Scots that uh, came in the uh, early 1800s and set up a Presbyterian Covenanters Church now in Grand Pre. Uh, it's a provincial heritage property. Uh, and a second one uh, at Grafton, just north of Berwick, Nova Scotia. And in telling the story, I refer to the, the names of the families and the families' experiences. Um, another, another article in the book refers to New Ulster. New Ulster was uh, Alexander McNutt's attempt in the 1760s to bring Ulster Scots to Nova Scotia. He wanted to bring seven to 8,000 of them and settle them. Uh, he did manage to uh, have a number settle in what we now call Londonderry, uh, not far from Pearl. Uh, some as well went to New, New Dublin on the South Shore. Uh, and I refer to the, uh, the names of the families there, the, uh, the prominent families and some of their experiences. Then I also uh, talk about the um, noticeable effects that we have in Atlantic Canada um, place names that uh, connect us back to the north of Ireland, as in Antrim and Halifax County, which is on the front of the, the book, Belfast in Prince Edward Island, uh, Clonus and Enniskillen in New Brunswick, uh, London area in, in New Brunswick and Nova Scotia, and quite a number of uh, names of uh, Ulster Scots who participated in the development of uh, Canadian society. As well, there are there are close to uh, 40 color uh, pictures uh, and diagrams within the book uh, to try to enhance the description and experience of the Ulster Scots. Okay. Um, so, um, you, you mentioned some of the communities now the the Covenanters, there's also a group of them up around the Chignecto area as well. I there think. were uh, the uh, be... the Somerville himself. Uh, he was from County Down, Northern Ireland. He uh, left there at the age of 16 to Glasgow, uh, obtained his BA from University of Glasgow. And then he came out first to, uh, to St. John in New Brunswick. And then uh, down to Chignecto, he married uh, Mary Dickey, who was from uh, that part of uh, northern New Brunswick. Her, her brother, one of her brothers, Robert Dickey, was a father of Confederation, uh, which was an interesting connection. Uh, and uh, he stayed in New Brunswick for a number of years, uh, helping to establish the church there before taking the post at Grand Pre in Horton, they called it. Okay. And now I, I know, and you mentioned that you had an interest in the United Empire Loyalists, and I, I noticed the, the three other previous books you wrote were in regards to the Empire Loyalists. So um, is this an I know it's an offshoot of you said you're personal, but was there a, is there a great deal of crossover where there are groups of Empire Loyalists that were these um, Ulster Scots as well that wound up coming to Atlantic Canada yes, or elsewhere in, in Canada? In fact, I'm an example of that. My my first United Empire Loyalist ancestor was an Ulster Scot. So that's, again, part of the tie-in. Uh, and uh, one of the chapters in the book focuses on uh, Charles Inglis, who was the uh, first bishop of uh, British America. And he came from Southwest County Donegal uh, in Ireland. 
uh, been out as a teacher to the American colonies. Eventually, after being quite a loyalist, he had to flee uh, from New York. Uh, he received the appointment to Halifax as the first bishop uh, and quite a colorful character. Uh, he was responsible for the largest growth of, uh, I guess, uh, Anglican churches throughout the Maritimes. Left his mark in many places and, and established uh, King's University and King's College at, Ed at Edgehill. So, uh, and, and there are quite a few other examples as well. There's a, there's a marshal uh, who's buried in Guysboro, who was a captain in uh, Carolina's uh, Loyalist uh, Regiment during the American Revolution, who had to flee through Florida, St. Augustine at the end of the war, up to Halifax, and then received a land grant. Uh, he's buried in the cemetery at, at, in Guysboro. So uh, in, in a larger group uh, in, in Hans County, in Rodden, uh, there's a number of the loyalists that were evacuated there from the Carolinas uh, were Ulster Scots. So, now, so I, I, the book I'm really sorry. carries through from the, the earliest uh, Ulster Scots it, re it refers to are in the uh, 18th century, the United Empire Loyalists, up to uh, the most recent story I have is one about a Ulster Scott in the 20th century who served uh, in the First World War in the Ulster Division uh, and came back to Canada and became a president of the Old Comrades Association in Toronto of the uh, Ulster Division. Okay. So one of my goals with this podcast is to try and engage people interested in family and local history. Um, so I'm just going to ask you a little bit more sort of around that. First of all, um, is there anything that would give a person clues that their ancestors might be part of this group of Ulster Scots? Is there any uh, naming patterns that are common or um, you mentioned the, the Covenanters, which would be the the, the, the Scots, the, the Presbyterians, and the uh, adherence to Westminster Confession. You also mentioned Bishop Inglis um, from the Anglican Church. Is Were they mostly, the, this would be the, the Protestant part of Scotland, Ulster, um, but are there, would there be Catholic communities as well? Is there, like I said, so what, what would help me if I thought, you know, I've traced my my ancestor back, and I'm not sure where they came from, but I'm 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 not sure if it's Ireland, Scotland, um, because of their name. Like, is there is, are there clues that would sort of give me to be so I'd know where to look to see if I could find a record of them um, pr before they came here? Well, in, in doing in, in doing my own family research, as an example, one of one of the biggest clues is going to be their their religion. Probably, uh, my um, grandparents were married in the Presbyterian Church in uh, First Monaghan Presbyterian Church in County Monaghan, Presbyterian formerly being Church of Scotland. So, uh, if you and if your surname is one that you think came from Scotland, uh, I find a common uh, mistake some people make is they think that their elders came directly from Scotland. They leave out the, the 150 years they spent in the north of Ireland uh, before they came to Canada. Uh, but probably the surname and the religion are going to be the most common. Although, given the short distance, uh, you know, you can people have swam the distance from the north of Ireland over to Scotland before, and it's been going on for centuries. Since the 1400s and before, perhaps, uh, there, there's a, a, a lot of the North that has, as you say, they're not just Presbyterians now. Um, the church there, too, has changed over time. Some of my family connections attended the uh, Church of England, um, so and Methodist as well. I had Campbells on my mother's side, Campbells and Fergusons. The good two great Scottish sounding names. Well, they, they came in the 1840s, 1847, the potato famine, uh, 
to Canada, although I don't think they were directly, probably economically affected by that, but, but they were Methodists uh, in that part of Ireland. But the clue there again was, was the surname, uh, kind of a giveaway. Uh, and then when you look into the search of the church, uh, there's a Presbyterian Historical Society in Ireland that has tremendous records. Uh, and I contacted them and was able to get the uh, baptismal information for, uh, there were 13 members of my grandparents' family. Uh, I was able to get all of their dates, which uh, what really pleased me. Uh, and um, then I was able to contact a local, you have to go on the ground almost, searcher, uh, in Monaghan, who he personally held uh, a copy of the church census records going back to 1800. Uh, in most of uh, Ireland, uh, your best record, reliable record, is going to be the church church record if you can get a hold of it. Well, the earliest records available for that church are the 1800 ones that have survived, early 1800. And the McConnell family appeared in, in the first census they did, which was 1801. Well, I was thrilled to find that. Uh, those would be the two main indicators for me, a surname and religion. But then if you can find uh, or have some idea of the geographic area in which they uh, may have come from, then contact a, a local um, historical or genealogical association. I think that very often the local groups seem to be most in contact with the heritage. So if I haven't gone to that point to determine that they are definitely Irish, they came via Ireland and, uh, from Scotland. And is there, would there be communities that would be commonly settled around the Maritimes? You mentioned a few of them that, um, are those are those those ones that will give clues, or um, so that if, or uh, I like you said, I know some of the ones here in PI, um, and I wreck. Well, what 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 I've found is that over time, that because of so many of the uh, not much. Houston and Smith, they did a study on Irish immigration to Canada. Uh, and uh, up until the uh, late 19th century, over 50% of the Irish who came were Protestant. And a large percentage of them came from the North of Ireland. But because they came under the, the assistance of the, the British uh, and as part of the British, very often they didn't settle in large groups, although they encouraged others to come. One that I came across recently was, uh, are you familiar with Harborville, uh, Nova Scotia, just above Berwick, on the Bay of Fundy there? Uh, it was formerly called Gibbons Wharf, uh, and it was named after a William Gibbon uh, who came from Northern Ireland. Uh, he came out originally in the early 1800s to St. John, New Brunswick. Uh, and had a merchant business there. And then he acquired land over across in the area of uh, Harborville. And he encouraged others from the North of Ireland to come, the Hamilton family. Hamilton is a very common name in the North of Ireland. A lot of the names associated with the North of Ireland come from the lowlands of Scotland. And Hamilton is one of those names. Um, and even... Margaretsville, further along the shore, I found in Margaretsville uh, more Ulster Scots names, but they were mixed in with uh, people from Scotland, people from England, uh, other Europeans at the same time. So, so there's no, it's hard to pick out those distinct communities, like, I guess, ar around Grand Pre and um, right. where the church was would be an obvious one. There would be some um of that my my migration there to a, a common area or if there, if there was enough to to start a church but generally they 
they assimilate it and it might be a little harder to 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 find out than if you if you don't know where that they actually came from Ireland or um, yeah they did assimilate but you will find them in in Colchester County in Hans County uh, it just uh, a lot of this requires a lot of digging but if you go back far enough uh, and, and a lot of the names have changed over time the community names uh, it, the exploration is is part of the part of the enjoyment I find it. Uh, it's like it's like a puzzle trying to put the pieces all together uh, but, but it, it it's not just names and dates uh, you know or it's also trying to figure out who else is there and why they got there and how did it how did this happen um, amazing so I, I i think yeah your book would probably be a good resource in that too if you knew if you were a person was reading and see some of those names mentioned and the, their family is from that community and um it might be you know a good place if they were if they weren't sure so the the actual scots to ulster migration um now, as you mentioned, it's a, it's a close distance and there was um, a lot of back and forth. Um, but is there, is there a period that, you know, that is really um, where there's that larger amount of, where the, the sort of the mass migration at one, is, was there a, a period there where that happened or is it just had been gradual? Or, Yeah, yeah, well, yes, of, of course. They, they call it the plantation period uh, in the 17th century after the the uh, Protestant king had defeated the Catholic uh, to try to subdue uh, the north of Ireland and what they viewed as the rebellious Irish. Uh, the, most of the lands were deeded out to um, supporters of the English cause. Those supporters then brought over um, their serfs and primarily uh, people from the lowlands of Scotland, names like uh, Craig and Hamilton and um, Armstrong, very common, uh, Irwin, and, and populated most of the uh, counties of Ulster. Some of the counties weren't part of the plantation, Monaghan wasn't part. But because of the numbers involved, uh, there was expansion. Uh, and at, at the time, I mean, to take one county, for example, population changes. I mean, Monaghan now, County Monaghan, has a population approximately uh, maybe 5% Protestant. Uh, by the early 1800s, the population of Monaghan was over 25% Protestant. Um, so it, through migration, a lot of those people for other economic or social reasons moved over time and, and has changed the dynamic. I mean, one of the interesting things I always think too, that, that different in the United States than here, uh, a lot of the, the so-called Scotch-Irish, and you find the phrase Scotch-Irish referred in the States more than Ulster Scots. And initially, I think that in part, came about from being, they weren't exclusively from the north of Ireland. Um, have, have you been to Dublin? No, I haven't. So, right? Well, one of our first trips there years ago as a family, I was really quite surprised to be the main tourist bureau in Dublin. It's a remarkable building, great large stone building. It's a former Presbyterian church. Um, at one, in the early 1900s, uh, the census for uh, Dublin, it had a majority Protestant population. I mean, Guinness beer that we drink, uh, Guinness Brewery, the Guinnesses, Guinness is a Scottish name. The Guinness family came from Scotland. Uh, a lot of those people as well, when her, times got tough, they moved to America, those Scots. And when they got to America, they called them Scots Irish. You, you see, the thing that's happened, Ulster Scots, that word has only come into a more common usage, I think, in the last 30 years. 
uh, in the north of Ireland. Uh, and because of the timing of this, it's connecting it more with Canada too. There are some writings you'll find in Canada. There was a group, uh, just like what Alexander McNutt tried to do, he brought out two ships full of uh, Ulster Scots to Nova Scotia, to Halifax. Well, they did this successfully in Ontario. There was one group that went to Wolf Island uh, family, 60 families, I believe it was. Uh, and they were referred to in this article as Scotch Irish. I think the author was influenced by the American experience. So it, just different comparisons, but uh, just because you find a relative with a Scottish sounding name who comes from Cork, you know, doesn't mean necessarily that they're, uh, and over time you'll find, you know, many different <laughs> names going in different directions. I, I think uh, we all have some of that probably. Definitely. I, I, I just don't know how you, you knew I was a Guinness drinker. Uh, so is the, I, you know, this has all really been fascinating to me. Uh, my, my family is, as from what I, I knew previously about my history, my, 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 on my mom's side, it's all Scottish. My dad's side, it's pretty much Irish. Um, and I think there's a little English in there, but we don't really like to admit that, um, you know, uh, being both Scots and Irish, there's, you know, that the long-term rivalry uh, of the, the conquering English that we try to like to forget. But, uh, you know, I'm, I really do find this really f fascinating. And um, so if the, um, I'm looking and I know, it's, you know, I'm a, a big supporter of, of being able to actually see a lot of physical things when you go and you're searching your ancestors. Um, but especially with these times with COVID now, and, and I think COVID has actually brought in a lot of people interested in genealogies that might not have been before. And it's also brought resources that um, have been there uh, a little more online. So as a person sitting on this side of the ocean where we are um wh where would be where would be the sort of the places where if i was looking to find out this information where where should i start you mean looking for information about your ulster stock if i'm if i'm looking about my information i know i um yeah if i if uh, i'm at in order if i if i thought i had some interest in it I would, I'm also a life member of the Ulster Historical Foundation. Okay. Uh, in, in, based in, in Northern Ireland. Originally, when it started up many, many years ago, it was called the Ulster Scots Heritage Association. Uh, it has conducted uh, seminars uh, throughout North America, including Halifax. Uh, usually, it, can, it comes every year and has. Um, seminars open to the public in different cities, uh, sometimes Toronto. We were fortunate to have one in Halifax a few years ago, but they provide uh, genealogical services. They have a member's journal uh, where you can put your names, your interests in, so you can find other people uh, with similar interests. Uh, they publish articles, books, about family histories uh, for all of the counties. Um, I would go to it first and as, as a resource. Great. Well, thank you for that, sharing that. Um, so, yeah, I really, I really do appreciate you coming in to talk about your book. book. Um, I've placed links on my website so that my listeners can see where they can order it from. And I, I do really encourage them. Um, so before I go, I just have a, a few more questions, if you don't mind. First of all, are you in the process, you mentioned you're retiring, so are you in the process of um, writing any more books? And if you wouldn't mind, are you able to short, sort of share the, the subject matter? Well, my, my main area of interest has been connected to the research I've done. I, I, I continue to do research in local Nova Scotia and maritime history. So I'm, I, and most of that interest has related to United Empire Loyalists 
and to Ulster Scones. Uh, I, it, it's difficult right now with COVID to, to get access to primary documentation. Um, so I, I do have several ideas uh, for moving forward on this. The books I've written so far have not focused on specific individuals or life history or um, detailed uh, investigations of, they've explored many different people and locations. Uh, I'd like to be able to, I think, go with one or two and, and show, if I can, uh, their experience and how that relates to maritime history and, and genealogy in general. Um, that's, that sounds great. And I, I'd love to have you back again when you, you do get your next book written, the, uh, when it's uh, approaching release or just after it's released. So we can talk about that. Uh, also, I'm, I am planning on doing an episode in the, the future about the empire loyalists. So I'd love to, if you, um, have you back, uh, maybe if to talk about that, if you'd be interested. Uh, 